So we move into chapter two of this textbook. Uh, it's called the introduction to conduction. It's heat conduction that we're studying. So they don't always put heat in front of the conduction. Uh, it's a uh, very uh, mathematical. Uh, it's just a rigorous differential equations, PDE type of chapter. So first of all, if we go back to the conduction rate equation that was known as Fourier's law, uh, we'll write it a number of times, but um, in this chapter, we want to express it using vector differential uh, um, descriptions of uh, vector calculus. So we'll end up with something like, instead of Q double prime is equal to minus K dt dx, which is where we left off last time, we'll get Q double prime is equal to minus K del T. What? Del T. What? Gradient of the temperature field. We'll go back and talk a little bit about the thermal property called the thermal conductivity. We covered it a lot already, but we'll cover it again. It's a very important property. And then we're going to talk about alpha. It's a thermal diffusivity. It's just a K divided by rho C. It's a new property. Hey, mass density, specific heat, and thermal conductivity we're all familiar with. You take the ratio, K over rho C, you get a new one. You call it thermal diffusivity. Okay. Uh, then we have the heat diffusion equation. What? We have the conduction rate equation. Now we have the heat diffusion equation. This is basically conservation of energy. Energy conservation. This is thermal one. That's what that is. Thermodynamics one. Ener conservation of energy. But what happens is we do it for infinitesimally small little control volume around a point, and then we get a differential equation. We get a PDE, a partial differential equation. It'll be second order in space. Hence, we need how many boundary conditions? Because it's second order in space, it has two spatial derivatives. You know, it's got to have two, not two, it's second order, like the second derivative in space. So it has first derivative and second derivative in space. And uh, so you need two boundary conditions. If you had th th both in the X and in the Y, then you need like four, two for the X direction, two for the Y direction. Okay, and then if it has only one time derivative, how many initial conditions do we need? Or boundary conditions that are associated with time? Only one. So because it's second order in space and first order in time, you just need one. And because we always start, we call it the initial condition. But in dynamics, you have second order in time. And so then you, you could have both initial uh, displacement, initial velocity. That would be like two um, time boundary conditions. Or you could have the location at this time and the location at that time, and now you got a little more challenging mathematically, but your your uh, your your time boundary conditions have been separated, and they're not at the same initial time. Often you have to do something like a shooting method if that rings you know true. If you're remembering something like that for the dynamics, well, guess what? This class is easy. I'm I'm just telling you, it's easy compared to dynamics. There is no thermal uh, second order uh, term. It's just first order. You just had like a thermal capacitance. You don't have any thermal inductance, if that makes sense. And so it's pretty easy in that regard compared to your dynamics classes. Okay, then to solve this PDE, so we need initial and boundary conditions, just like I described. And then you have the mathematical challenging, a challenge of solving uh, for the temperature at all locations and all times. All right, Fourier's law. Can you write it by memory? Sure. Q double prime equal to minus K dt dx. That's a gradient. And what is this? Thermal conductivity. It's such an important property that we want to make sure that we cover it. It is simply a material property. You change the material, and you need to look up that property for that new material. It, it measures how readily heat passes through it. High H, I'm sorry, high K, high thermal conductivity, what does that mean? 
it's a good conductor. And if it has low thermal conductivity, K, what does that mean? It's a good insulator. Sometimes we want to promote the heat transfer. We want to select materials with high thermal conductivity. Sometimes we want to make it insulation so we have low. And so you can interpret it like this. You could say K is equal to the Q double prime divided by dt dx. So you say, look at what is the heat flux for a particular gradient? How about one degree C per meter uh, thermal gradient? And uh, what this gives me back what the heat flux will be. That's the value of K. So if I say the K is, I don't know, 15, you'd say, oh, you're, I'm going to be able to get 15 watts per meter squared heat flux for a 1 degree C per meter temperature gradient. That's one way of interpreting K. Otherwise, just stay with something like high, good conductor, low, good insulator. So 99.999% of the time in this class, we're going to be talking about this type of material. And right now is the 0.001% of the class that we talk about this type of material. All right, well, what is this word right here? Anisotropic. What does it mean? It's got directionally dependent properties. And the world is made up, especially engineered materials are made up to have different mechanical properties in, in, in particular directions or orientations. Uh, you could think of uh, carbon uh, reinforced composites. And they put in the composites in strands. And now, oh, those composites um, or the reinforcements have different um, properties. And so, it wouldn't be that the thermal conductivity is directionally independent. If it's anisotropic, it has some directional preference or orientation. So it may be a better conductor along the grains or along the fibers of a composite versus perpendicular to them. So, but here's your 0.001%. We're done. Everything in this class is isotropic. They just have no directional dependence. It, it's, it's all the same. Copper is, you know, no, no directional preference to the copper, aluminum, or air. All right, so this is one of those that I covered last time. Let me reinforce it again. If you plot on this scale the thermal conductivity, and I grabbed it off of this site such that they use the symbol lambda instead of K. In Europe, a lot of literature has lambda for the thermal conductivity. In the United States, thankfully, it's K, lowercase k, for the thermal conductivity. What are the units? You can see watts, and then they have meter to the minus 1, Kelvin to the minus. That, that's our familiar units, watts per meter Kelvin. And what would be the maximum k? 1,000. Anything above 1,000 out here? No, not on this plot. All right, what a, kind of a minimum? Uh, 0.01. Anything below 0.01 on this? No. Here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What is 5? What did we just measure? It's on a log scale, isn't it? We measured 5 orders of magnitude. So pretty well the world fits on 5 orders of magnitude for the thermal conductivity. Now, down here you have air. Is that moving air or stationary air? It's not moving air. It's right. It's got to be stationary when you talk about the thermal conductivity. When we get to convection, well, that's when we get natural convection, buoyancy-driven flow, and that'll promote the heat transfer, but just stationary air. Okay. Now, here is a numeric value that I grabbed, 0.024. So if you look at it, yeah, that looks like about 0.024. Let's take a look at the next one, liquid water. Liquid water comes in right around here. It's a log scale. I look it up. Maybe it's around 0.6. All right. What's another one? Ice. It's kind of interesting. Water in liquid form, water in ice form. The ice has a higher, about 1.6. I'm just throwing a number out there. They are temperature dependent. 
for ice. Then copper is another one. What's the value for copper? Depends what type of copper you're talking about. If it's 99.9% .9 copper, minimum, then it's around almost 400, 388. That's where I got some numbers. But if you mix a little aluminum with it, 5% aluminum, 95% copper, it's aluminum bronze, it uh, drops quite a bit, doesn't it? I don't know why. I'm glad you took a materials class, right? And then also brass. So you have copper, zinc, and there's a thermal conductivity. So you better be careful what exact type of copper you have, what's its composite. If you put out, I would just throw out a number of around 400 for the high end on copper, around 200 for aluminum, and there you go. Now, somebody ever say, hey, you and your friends are going to go out and have a party, right? And so you say, okay, everybody, how much money do you have? How much money do you have? Let's pool all our money, and then we'll find out how, what type of party we can have, right? Okay, so here you go. This number, around 400, it's hard to put in context, isn't it? But let's say one of your friends said, I have $400, and we can spend it all in one night. Wow, you're going to have a big party. And then your other friend says, I have, what is that in dollars? I have two cents. You have two cents, and you're going to contribute to the party. So try to put these numbers in perspective. That's a big difference in the thermal conductivity. And another friend says, well, I have uh, 60 cents. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, one other says, I have a dollar 60. Uh, we're going we're gonna to freeload off my $400 friend for the night, I'm telling you. So anyway, you try and put these numbers in context. Hopefully you see that the, the, hot, the metals like that can have some very high thermal conductivities. And if you can hold air stationary, it is a great insulator. The challenge is, is making sure it doesn't move. And so if you ever look at fiberglass insulation, you put glass in there and spin it, right? And it's all matted up. Well, the glass is a higher kind of conductor than the air. It's to try to hold the air stationary. That's all the fiberglass uh, insulation does or other type of insulations like that. Or foam, they expand and they make little bubbles in it. The little itty bitty bubbles are little isolated air packets or whatever backfill gas they have in the bubbles. And hopefully they're pretty stationary because the bubbles are pretty small and you've got a pile of them. Good foam insulation can have a thermal conductivity down in the vicinity of stagnant air. But it's going to be pretty hard to get lower. Oh, you can, but it's going to be pretty hard to get lower thermal conductivity than stagnant air. All right. Well, if you have metals, a good electric conductor, guess what, is a good thermal conductor. The same flow for the electricity is the same mechanism for the flow of the heat in the material. And so this is electric conductivity. This is thermal conductivity. They're plotting it for a bunch of different materials. Oh, it doesn't line up perfectly, but they're showing the general trend is an excellent trend. Fluids. Not all gases have lower thermal conductivity than all liquids, but in general, the thermal conductivity of a gas is lower than the thermal conductivity of a liquid. So here's a plot. It's a function of temperature. It has thermal conductivity. At the low end, what do we have? Steam, air, va ammonia vapor, carbon dioxide. Those are all gases, aren't they? But we sneak up here and we see hydrogen and helium. Guess what? They're a gas as well. Not only that, they're a really good ideal gas. What's special about hydrogen and helium that make them different than water vapor, ammonia vapor, carbon dioxide, air, which are gases also, but they're down in this vicinity? They're ideal, they're ideal. yeah. They're what? Pure, yeah. Uh, Monoatomic is a big one, and when they're monoatomic, plus also something else, density, yeah, you're getting there, something else. If somebody said, I got one property, I'm going to show you the property of hydrogen. That property of hydrogen is really small. 
small numerically compared to the same property of different ideal gases? Molar mass. No molar mass. And then, like a lot of people said, hey, I think it's density. Well, you have the ideal gas equation, right? So you have P is equal to, uh, uh, depends how you want to do it. P is equal to rho uh, R bar molar mass T. And so if you're, if you're saying, hey, the density is different because, yes, these are very light gases, but they're light because they have very low molar masses. So what's the molar mass of hydrogen? Two. Two kilograms per kilomole. What's the molar mass of helium? Four. What's the molar mass of air? Twenty-nine. What's the molar mass of carbon dioxide? 12 plus oxygen and oxygen, that's about 44. So this is about 29, this is about 44. Ammonia, ammonia is a little different, but guess what? It's not behaving as an ideal gas, probably. It's probably behaving as a real gas uh, in a lot of those cases. And then water vapor, H2O, is uh, 16, 17, is it 18? 18, molar mass of 18. Okay. So here are some of the liquids, water, ethylene glycol, and engine oil. Hey, where, is, where do we find this in your everyday use? Antifreeze. Thank you very much. It's nice to learn things, right? Just focus on the gases. What do the gases do as temperature goes up? What does the thermal conductivity of the gas tend to do? Stay flat, go down, go up, what? It goes up. And if you want it, you could look at ideal gases, and we don't have time, but the thermal conductivity is proportional to like temperature to the 0.5, or temperature is a little bit more than 0.5, like 0.7. But you can work that out theoretically, like a, to the square root of absolute temperature, 0.5. So as it goes up, there's going to be this trend of an ideal gas like that going up. Helium, hydrogen. All right. Uh, what about the oils or waters? Well, there's really, I mean, it goes up, then down, ethylene glycol up. What about oil down? You know, they're kind of all over. Just watch the fluid that you have. But when we come here to metals, the same thing. Uh, a lot of them go down with increasing temperature, but here's one kind of flat iron going down. What's stainless doing? About flat, go up a little bit. So just have to watch how some may be more temperature sensitive to the property than others. This is a very high temperature range, isn't it? 1,000 degrees C, so it's really pushing the boundary. But uh, this is on, what type of scale is this? This is 100, this is two, another increment of 100. This is on a linear scale, isn't it? So you don't need a log scale to see the difference here. They're a lot closer. But you could throw out a value of about 15 and about 50, 15 for stainless steel, about 50 for iron, maybe a little higher, some of them 70, 80. Uh, jump up to around, what, 200-ish um, for aluminum. I know it's not perfect. And throw around 400 or a little less for copper. Silver's higher, but hey, there's not too many things we build out of silver because of cost. We have a lot of heat promoting devices, especially known as radiators, made out of aluminum, and then variations of copper like brass. That's old, but pretty much everything's aluminum. But if an older car, you can still get a lot of money if it had a brass radiator. Okay, go down and recycle it. Now we're going to move into more mathematical section. Let's do a quick review. When we talk about a scalar field versus a vector field, I'm going to just draw it, draw it in 2D rectilinear like x, y coordinate system. A scalar field means I go out to this point and I say, what do you got? What do you got? Right? Tell me a little bit about what's happening at this location at this point. The scalar field just says, here's my number. I'm just going to tell you something like the temperature and it's 50 degrees at that point. What about over here? Well, it's 90 degrees at that point. What about over here? You, know, you just get a number at every point in the domain. That's a scalar field. So we would talk about the temperature at any location out there. What about a vector field? It's not just the magnitude. It's a magnitude. What's a vector? Magnitude plus direction. 
So I go out to that same point and I may get something like, oh, it's there. What, what do you mean? I'm going in this direction at that rate. So if I move in millimeters, meters, or whatever, I'm telling you how rapidly I'm changing if I move away from the point. Or here, maybe the, if the vector field is represented by a little vector at that point, and that vector has direction and magnitude. The magnitude is the rate of change in that direction. All right, how about this point? That could be like that. So, you, so at every location, I'm only showing in 2D, but this works in 3D as well, you get something like a vector field. Maybe from fluid mechanics, it was your velocity, the fluid little velocity going in that direction at some speed, right? But for this class, we're interested in heat flux. Q double prime is our preferred vector field, our heat flux. Now, what is our heat flux? Think about the area perpendicular to that direction, the area perpendicular to that direction, the area perpendicular to that direction, okay? And so it's normalized per unit area, per unit normal area. And it's how many watts, look at the units on this, watts per meter squared are flowing in that um, uh, direction. So um, how do we calculate this? Well, from our Fourier's law, we took a thermal property, known as a thermal conductivity, and we multiplied by some dt dx, and we put a minus sign in front of it, didn't we? And so you could kind of tell, oh, it's related to the rate of change of temperature in that direction. If I knew the rate of change of temperature, there you go. I multiplied by k, I have the heat flux. Okay. Um, what we want to do is, this is 1D, we want to generalize it. Well, if you generalize the temperature gradient, you introduce the gradient operator. And so when you generalize it, it's uh, minus K, this T. What? What is that symbol? It's called del, some, you know, del. It's the gradient operator, or just the gradient. You know, it's the gradient of the temperature field. So this is very interesting. So if you feed it, if you feed del, or let the gradient operate on a scalar temperature field, what do you get back? You get back a little vector field. Multiply that by K, put a minus sign in front of it, that, that's your heat flux. Can you write out what that looks like for the rectangular coordinate system? What does that gradient operator look like? Doesn't it, let's, let's stay with the gradient of T. Isn't it the partial of T with respect to X? Uh, I shouldn't do this for you. I should say, do you know what it is? Instead of just showing it to you. Do you know what it is? Can you write it down on a piece of paper? Can you write it down from memory? Do the gradient of T. I'm going to walk around and check a few. So I like to put a little unit vector. Sometimes I was taught, you know, like I with the little hat, like hat emphasizing unit vector, but that's not common or, or universal. Uh, sometimes you could put um, E in the X direction. Uh, or, and then E in the Y direction, but that's just I and J. We use the rectangular coordinate system so much. Plus the partial of T with respect to Y in the J, plus the partial of T with respect to Z in the K. Uh, professor, is this, is this like, uh, you know, X comma Y comma Z? Do I, do I get rid of these plus signs and put a comma and, and put parentheses or brackets on that? No, no, just like that. It's just like that. All right. Now, we're going to also talk about the divergence. 
Remember the divergence? Do you remember if I took this Dell operator and instead of just having it act on temperature, which it needs to, you need to feed it a scalar field. Isn't this a scalar field if you just have Dell operating on it? If I took Dell and treated it as a vector and dotted it with another vector, hey, what do I have around here that's a vector? Uh, Q double prime. Isn't Q double prime a vector field? Just like T was a scalar field. So I could take the del dot, they give it a special name, they call that divergence. Di divergence. And so now, hmm, let's not do del dot of um, Q double prime. Let's do it uh, on uh, this term right here, which is replacement for Q double prime minus K gradient of t. Isn't that q double prime? So we're going to substitute that. Now I can take the minus sign outside because it's just the constant multiplied by negative 1 that can come outside that dot product of the del operator. And let's treat the k, the thermal conductivity, as a constant. Let that come outside. And I'm going to have del dot gradient of t. Aha! You've seen it. Oh, look it. If I take the divergence of the gradient of a scalar field, that's simply the Laplacian of what? That scalar field. This is minus k del squared t. Why do they put del squared? Oh, just to confuse the newbies, you know, try and throw a monkey wrench, change your lingo a little bit and then throws everybody off. No, no, that's just out there and it's very, very common. But you can replace del squared with del dot del t. It's the divergence of the gradient. Okay, so hmm, let's say I had a vector. Uh, it's probably easier in review And if I go back to fluids. If I go back to fluids, what was V? V is a vector field. It's um, UI plus VJ plus WK. Is that the way you learned it? UVW, that's the component of the velocity in the X, and then the component of the velocity in the Y direction, and then the component of the velocity in the Z direction. Somebody says, give me the divergence of the velocity field. I'm going to let you struggle. Give it to me, please. Give me the divergence of the vector velocity. In the interest of time, all you do is set up something like this, dotted with something like this. We already had what's over here, ui plus vj plus wk, right? And then you say, okay, well, what is my del? Del, uh, maybe it's a partial with respect to x of something. Hey, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting, right? I plus the partial with respect to Y of something. Give it to me, please. I'm waiting in the J plus the partial, and I didn't leave enough room, with respect to Z. I'm waiting. Give it to me, please. Something, something in the K. Yeah. So now when you do the dot product, you just say, hey, both of the X components and the Y components and the Z components are made to be happy. So let's finish this out so we get that the divergence of the velocity vector field would be the partial of U with respect to X, the partial of V with respect to Y, and the partial of W with respect to Z. And then what do I do? Do I put an I and a J and a K there? Or do I just add them without the i, j, k? What do I do? No i, j, k. You're absolutely right. Thank you so much. So you just, that's it. If I gave you two vectors, I said, here's a vector A, and I want you to dot it with vector B, where vector A is a, x, i plus a, y, j plus a, z, k, and I dot it with the vector B, b, x, i plus 
BYJ plus BZK, what do you get back? You just get the product AX times BX plus AY times BY plus AZ times BZ. It's just a scalar, isn't it? Isn't that interesting that divergence requires a, a vector field, but it gives back a scalar field? <laughs> yeah. And so now the Laplacian, what do you feed a Laplacian? A scalar field like temperature. What do you get back? A scalar field. So... I do the divergence of the gradient of t. We're going to write this a number of times. Let's do it right here. Del squared t. What is that? You can work it out. I'm going to say you need to work it out. You need to review because, believe me, this is like the first couple lectures in EA2, Engineering Analysis 2. You can't go very far in Engineering Analysis 2 without this. I don't know how you can cover without having this cold. You've got to have this cold. But it comes out the second derivative of temperature with respect to the x and the second derivative of temperature with respect to y plus the second derivative of temperature with respect to z. Professor, I think I should have an i and a j and a k there. No, you don't. Don't need it. Nope, nope, nope. It's just added. That's it. Do you agree? That look good for the Laplacian? There's our good review. I wish I, you know, it's sometimes challenging because when I teach heat transfer, I want to go back and I want to reteach all of EA2. I don't have time. I want to reteach all of Thermo 1. I want to reteach all of fluids. I want to reteach all of Thermo. I can't do it. If you need to go back and review any of these, please do. And when you turn in your portfolios for some of these classes for extra credit, I'm going to look at you know, things like, hey, look at, see, you were doing Laplacian in chapter three, blah, blah, blah. Hey, look at this, you were doing the gradient, etc. So a lot of times we plot things in 2D, but the world doesn't always live only in 2D. It really lives in 3D, but it's really hard to show things. But this is your uh, plot, maybe red, deep red represents high temperature. And then you go ahead and put some isotherms on there, right? Lines of constant temperature. And you say, oh, well, the heat flux is, blah, it's perpendicular to the isotherm. Or here's another isotherm down here. And it, the heat flux is, you know, this way or that way. Okay. So think about temperature as a function of location. And then also the heat flux is a function of location. Let's press forward. We're going to get to this equation. What is this equation? Well, it's called the uh, heat diffusion equation. Um, what does it look like? Well, do you see this divergence of K gradient of T? Hey, that's what we just did a review of, isn't it? Um, what is this? A Q dot. Now, that's a volumetric heat source. Volumetric heat source. All right. Then we have our mass and specific heat multiplying what is this? What's it doing with respect to time? What's the temperature doing with respect to time? Is it going up? That means it's being heated. Is it going down? It's being cooled at that location. And if I look at it, if the, this is what the temperature is doing with respect to time. What do you think this term is representing? How the energy is changing at a location with respect to time because it's the density and the specific heat and the temperature if somebody said, uh, um, uh, if I have a chunk of mass this much and I had the specific heat and I changed its temperature this much, isn't that how much the Q was added to affect the change in the internal energy? Yeah. And so what you have it per unit volume, so you have uh, the density times the volume. And so you divide over by the volume. And now you, you see these familiar pattern of rho C delta T. Now this is changing temperature with respect to time, but that rho C is like a thermal um, inertia, uh, heat capacitance. All right. So with, we're going to derive this equation in a minute, but just look at it. What, the, what do you think? This is an energy balance equation, and it looks like something can flow into an object something can flow into an object 
And the sum of those two flows, if they're both positive, would lead to a accumulation. It's like your bank account. It's going to go up in money continuously, right? It's just going to accumulate money, 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 money. You're going to die very, very, very rich. But if every now and then the in is really an out because it's a negative in, and maybe this is a negative in, so it's an out, ooh, ooh, and we're going to go broke. There's going to be not an accumulation, a negative accumulation in your bank account. So this is an, this is what this is. is a heat diffusion equation is an energy balance equation. What did they do here? Well, they said, hey, guess what happens to K? Comes outside, and then del dot del, or the, the divergence of the gradient is uh, Laplacian. And then what do they do here? They just divide over by K. And then you said, hey, didn't they introduce a new property called alpha thermal diffusivity, which is defined as K over rho C? This again, I kind of wish sometimes they didn't introduce new terms all the time, but hey, it's so common it's introduced. So it's an energy conservation equation. It is used, the purpose of that PDE. What does PDE stand for? Partial differential equation. Why is it partial? Because it has partial derivatives. Why does it have partial derivatives? Because it has more than one independent variable. It has a variable like x and t, or x, y, z, and t. And so as shown right here, it has four independent variables. And you're trying to solve for one of them. Temperature It's a dependent variable. It depends on what value of x and t and y and z and all that. So you're going to set up this PDE, that's the energy uh, heat diffusion equation, and you're going to solve for it. It's a partial differential equation. You're going to need so many boundary conditions and so many initial conditions because it's first order in time, just one initial condition. Second order in space, so for every space variable, you need two boundary conditions. And we have to do it 99% of the time in rectangular or Cartesian coordinates, but few percent of the time, maybe not 99, how about this, 90% of the time and 5% of the time and 5%. Often, it's just 1D that we're interested in the cylindrical and 1D in the spherical, radial, out, radial. Okay, so you ready for the derivation? This is the favorite part the students love. So I, I put it on two slides and I, call, I just go, go through it because I could spend the whole lecture. You ever had a class where, and I used to teach this way, I was so in love with the derivations. And then at the end of the semester, the students gave me love comments too. <laughs> and they said, oh, Professor, that's great that you love all the theory and the derivations, but please solve some problems. So in order to solve some problems, I've got to kind of blow through the derivation. So here it is. So you grab in a coordinate system, it's best to show it just in X and Y. A volume. Now, this volume could be a volume in space or it could be a volume in mass. It's probably better if I call it a control mass, but I'm going to call it a control volume and I'm going to not, I'm going to skip that part of the discussion. Okay. And I'm going to talk about the accumulation. It's the rate of change or increase of the internal energy in that control volume. If it's positive, I'm getting more. If it's negative, I'm going down. In what energy? Then I have conduction heat transfer in. Now, I put a big cap in because the signs can get you tripped up. Sometimes it's like, no, no. I'm talking about the net accumulation or flow into the control volume. That's going to make it the accumulation go up. And then also have some generation. It's a net heat source. Believe me, that's only in. There's no real heat destruction out there that makes any sense. How, how would you have this heat generation? Electric resistive heating is a number one. Second would be maybe some modeling of chemical reactions, some oxidation or some reaction going on. Anyway, leave that for another day. But this is the big one, the conduction net conduction in. So our accumulation term, you just have the internal energy is a mass specific heat and the difference in temperature between that and the reference. So if it's getting hot compared to the reference, higher temperature, it's going up. All right, so we say we want it for this volume, so integrate over the volume. 
we have a C. This is where my discussion breaks down a little bit. I need to put a CP on there, which really is constant pressure, and I should focus on a control mass, but I'm not doing that, but it's just CP. Got it? All right. All right, now, what about this second term over on the other side of the equal sign, this conduction? Well, we evaluate the heat flux at every point on the control volume. Now, at every point, I need to have an outward-directed unit normal vector. I am so thankful that all the books and every mathematical book that I've looked at, Applied Engineering Math, they never have N as an inward-directed unit normal vector. N is always an outward directed. I'm so thankful, right? So now that I have that defined, I can take my heat flux at every location, Q double prime. How am I going to get the Q double prime at every location? By Fourier's law. Okay. And I'm going to take what type of product to pick off what actually is going out. What type of product is this little round it's the dot product. I got two little vectors at every location. I take the dot product. If they're perfectly aligned and they're perfectly going out, and this one is magnitude one, <coughs> then you'll just get back the magnitude of the Q double prime at that location. But if they're in the opposite direction, let's look at this case right over here. What about that? It'll give you a negative in, or I'm sorry. This, will, this is a transfer out which is, um, okay, that Q dot N is an out, and then uh, what I need to do is I want it to be the net transfer in by conduction, so I'm going to swap that in a second. But right now, these are always going out of the control volume. Here, this would be a negative out, which is a positive in. Let's go over here. This is that switch right there, because I moved from a net out to a net in watch out for your minus signs. All right, what about my third term, the heat generation term? Well, we have this Q dot, that's what the book uses. I add a little SRC and I would like to get rid of the dot, but that would only confuse the students because I would be deviating from the textbook and I want you to read the textbook. So I'm gonna try and just say I'm adding the SRC to emphasize, but the book just uses Q dot. It's how many watts per meter cubed of source just show up in heat in the energy equation. Do an integral over the volume. Now I have an area integral for the flow across the boundary. I have a volume integral and I have a volume integral. Sure would like to convert them all to a volume integral. Glad we took that class because there's a theorem what theorem? Ever heard of divergence theorem? Absolutely. There was a bunch of other theorems in mechanical engineering we don't make much use of. You can look at them, but their electricals make more use of them. This is the one in mechanical we like to use a lot, divergence theorem, which says, I can convert an area to a volume integral. If I take the divergence, that's why they call it the divergence theorem, of the integrand. And what is that? It's just K del T. So if I take the divergence, boom, I have a volume, volume, volume. I'll put all the volumes in one volume integral. And then you play a little bit of math thinking about it. And you say, you know what? That volume was arbitrary. I could have picked this volume, that volume. I could have picked a itty bitty little volume around a particular point. The only way this math works always is that at every point, that integrand equals zero. A little bit of logic right there, but it has to equal zero every point. So you move from a volume integral to a PDE, a partial differential equation. QED, that's what we set out to do. In good old Latin, we're there. All right. Okay, if K is constant, comes outside, you get the Laplacian. If you divide everything by K, you get the thermal diffusivity alpha. Now, does it matter if it's rectangular, cylindrical, or spherical? No, it doesn't. We can do this in any coordinate system. You just have to get the Laplacian in all of those coordinate systems. So we go back and review. What about this rectangular coordinate system? I know this is where I put you to sleep. 
you have the X and the Y and the Z. You say, I'm at this location of a point. This is where it gets a little confusing because they say, you know, that location of the point is give me a magnitude of X, give me a magnitude of Y and a magnitude of Z. I thought you said X stood for the X axis, like a variable, yeah? And then sometimes it represents a location, like a mag like five centimeters or something. Sorry, that's just life. And then you have out here a little unit vector in the I, E of X, that's a little different symbol for unit vector in the x direction, unit vector in the y direction, unit vector in the z direction, we sort hand those to i, j, and k. So we're talking about temperature at a particular location. Then we talk about the gradient of temperature. This is a review. Remember this? I don't even need that parenthesis, but I put it on there anyway. Maybe that confuses you. And then if you do the Laplacian, this is a review, we already covered all that, but sometimes it's the X represents a location, sometimes it's the variable, so it's a derivative with respect to the X direction, variable derivative with respect to the Y direction. Hopefully that looks simple, right? Because when you move to the cylindrical, that's where it's a little more challenging. So we still have an X, Y, and Z, but we're not going to describe the location of a point by X, Y, and Z. We're going to use R theta, same Z, but the R theta is new for the cylindrical. What's R theta? Well, it's R is the perpendicular distance from the Z axis to the point. All right, and then what's theta? From the positive X axis, swinging over just so that you can get underneath of it and then come straight up. So that's your R theta Z. What's Z? That's the height. Hopefully that makes sense. Good. So you still have the gradient operator. What's the change in the R times the unit vector in the R? What is the change here in the theta? But you need a 1 over R D T D theta. Don't forget the one over R, but guess what? Rarely, rarely use it anyway. We Almost always we just are down to this only one term, but in, for mathematical completeness, there's the full term, and then here it is for EZ. Likewise, when you get down here to the heat diffusion equation, you need that Laplacian. This term for how it's changing radially, this term angular theta, and this term in the Z, Almost always, we focus here. This is like 99% of the problems. It's just, I put a layer of insulation around my pipe. The heat flow is from the inner radius to the outer radius, out the radius, of the, through the perpendicular distance of the layer of the pipe. And there you go. That, if I want to solve for the temperature distribution, that term is there. Okay? So almost always, these other terms are you know, it's boiled down to one dimensional in the radial dimension for our cylindrical coordinate system. All right, you ready for the most challenging? <laughs> Spherical? Okay, now we really have two angles, right? We have the R, the perpendicular dist, not perpendicular, from the origin out. Then we have theta and phi. Theta from in, the, in this XY plane, phi with respect to the Z axis. You have to be able to get the gradient and the Laplacian. The Laplacian, almost always we focus just on that first term. And aren't you so thankful? Aren't you so thankful that those two terms are almost always... Oh, they put them in the book. That way you can impress your friends. Hey, I'm studying heat transfer. Let me show you one of the equations we have to solve on a regular basis. You open it up, you show them that equation. They just Their eyes get big. You say, yeah, we got a tough program. But then uh, right here, this is the one, this is the only part really we saw repeatedly. All right? What is that? I have a spherical tank. I put a layer of insulation on it, and the heat transfers straight out radially out the spherical uh, uh, in layer of insulation. There it is. Heat diffusion equation in all its glory. Rect rectangular, cylindrical, spherical. I have that Laplacian, I have the heat source, I have the accumulation term. 
A lot of times the K is constant, comes outside, but if it's not constant, you leave it in, you have to deal with it mathematically. Boundary conditions, challenging, very challenging. Let's say I have uh, X axis and I'm going from zero to L. And here I'm trying to just show one dimension and I say, oh, the temperature at that surface is a given value, like 50 degrees C or something. Well, guess what? I have to translate that into a specified temperature boundary condition. It would be something like the temperature at X equal to L at any future time T is equal to the value of 50 degrees C. You get better if you apply and write these boundary conditions. Let's say I have the same slab and um, this may be a little challenging to think of x make this this is l this is zero at this surface i have a q double prime at that surface maybe it's 50 watts per meter squared how are you going to accomplish that i don't know i'm just saying it's 50 watts per meter squared okay well you come over here and you would say i have a specified heat flux which is q double prime at x equal to L is equal to Q double prime at the surface. Okay, then I can replace this term right here by minus K dt dx at x equal to L. And so what it's doing is it's putting a, 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 a restraint on the slope of the temperature at the surface. Because, you know, it's like, okay, if I told you what the K was, K is so many, let's say stainless steel, 15 watts per meter degree C. And I told you what the flux was, 50 watts per meter squared. Boom, you do it. All right? Okay. Um, often, these end up having some sort of laser application. This is, I'm just giving you, and, and they're, they're shining a laser on it. So it's not that the Q double prime is a positive 50, it would be a negative, meaning it's forced into the slab because it's pounding away at the surface with a laser, something like that. And, but mathematically, you just have a negative Q double prime. Then, then actually this negative over here, both of those would cancel. Last one, convection. Okay, here it is. I'm redrawing it. There's L. This is X, goes from 0 to L, and out here, we have a fluid with H and T infinity. Well, what we're saying is the conductive flux, Q double prime conduction, at a millimeter to the left of the surface L is equal to the convective flux into the fluid. So, what was our way, uh, so let me draw that, Q double prime conduction at L with the little minus is equal to Q double prime convection at L. Okay, so this is minus K partial, well, am I using partial derivatives or ordinary derivatives? Depends if the problem has more than one independent variable. You use a partial derivative, or if it only has x, you use an ordinary derivative. This is at x equal to L with the little minus. That means in the solid, just a little bit to the left of the surface. And then this is uh, H. Then this is TS minus T infinity. What is TS? TS is the temperature at x equal to L. This is the most challenging boundary condition because it has the value of the temperature at the surface and the gradient, the slope at the surface, but you can handle it. Okay, we need to solve some problems. I think we're getting close. Okay, we have a plain wall that has thickness 2L. And notice that the book loves to put x equal to zero right there. And so, so this is negative L. This is plus L. What is the thickness? The thickness is 2L. Don't get confused. Right? The X is the center. 
Okay, there's, there is heat generation in the wall, so the Q dot exists. And both the wall surface temperatures are maintained at TS. So right here, this is TS. And this temperature at this side is TS. Give me the temperature profile in the wall. How are you going to solve for T as a function of X? Then tell me where the, what is the maximum temperature in the wall. And then find the heat flux at the wall surface at X equal to L. All those make sense? Let me give you an outline. You're going to have a PDE. Now, this PDE, because it's steady state and only one dimensional, boils down to an ODE. A simple, ordinary differential equation. Only X is the independent variable, not X in time. It's steady state. Not X and Y. It's just X. Where does that equation come from? Our heat diffusion equation, conservation of energy. All right. You then have two boundary conditions. Mathematically, what would be the boundary condition? I would suggest you focus on only in this region between 0 and L, and I would get a boundary condition at 0 and a boundary condition at L. The easy boundary condition at L is specified temp. The hard one is x equal to 0. Can somebody help the rest of the class by suggesting what is the boundary condition? at x equal to zero. It's not a specified temperature. It's one of these other ones. It's going to not a specified temperature. It's going to be a specified heat flux or convective heat flux. It's the heat flux. Okay. What is the magnitude of that heat flux at x equal to zero? And there's a key word, symmetry. What do you mean symmetry? I can cut this problem down the middle and flip the right side over on top of the left side. Isn't it symmetrical? Everything says it's symmetrical. The K over here is the K over there. The Q dot over here, the Q dot over there. The temperature boundary condition, temperature boundary condition. Somebody says, sketch out the temperature profile. You would go, hmm, I think it'll be flat. No, there's heat generation. I think it'll be dip. No, there's heat generation. It's not colder in the middle. Where is it hotter? Where's it hot? It's hottest in the middle. And guess what? It's a boring quadratic. I shouldn't say that boring, right? But it's a quadratic. And what about the slope right here at the top, right in the middle? Specified heat flux because of symmetry. It's zero heat flux. That's your hard boundary condition. Now that I have my two boundary conditions, my differential equation, I forget that I'm an aspiring engineer. I pretend to be a mathematician, and believe me, that's a big pretense, right? It's like you're really pretending to be a mathematician. And all you do is solve it. And then you come out with a temperature profile. I need to let you do this. Raise your hand when you get it solved. I'm going to give you enough time. Thank you. While I check up here, do a little double team. All right, you ready to pick it up here? The second derivative of temperature with respect to space squared, you put the K there, you have the plus the Q dots equal to zero. Did we get that far? Yes. Good. So what we want to do is we want to get a second derivative and maybe put minus Q dot divided by K and treat that as a constant on the other side for a while. The boundary condition, uh, I'm going to call this number one and then number two. Number one is the rate of change of temperature with respect to x at the location x equal to zero is zero. And the boundary condition number two is the temperature at L is equal to Ts. Okay? Now, once that's done, it's just Ea2, that's all. I mean, just Ea1, actually. Ea1. It's not even Ea2. So you go to the first derivative of temperature with respect to x. What did I do? I separated and integrated is equal to minus q dot divided by k times x plus a constant of integration. If we now apply that first boundary condition, because it, it's a restriction on the derivative, I put in that for the derivative 
is equal to 0 at x equal to 0, what does C1 have to be? 0. So you apply the boundary condition number 1, and you conclude that the constant C1 is 0. So now we do another separate and integrate, separate and integrate. We get the temperature is equal to minus Q dot divided by 2K x squared plus a new constant of integration. Call it C2. Now, yes, we apply the boundary condition here. Okay. This one, maybe I do it a little slower. I'll get that uh, TS is equal to minus Q dot divided by 2K L squared plus C2. So C2 isn't that equal to TS plus Q dot L squared divided by 2K? Isn't that what I conclude the constant of integration is? And now at this point, I can substitute that constant of integration. So the final answer, T is equal to, and I'm going to just put this term first, TS. Then I'm going to group these other two terms, and we'll have plus Q dot L squared divided by 2K, 1 minus X over L squared. Now. It probably shows that I don't want to go to a clean page. I want to do it very quickly, so I'm skipping probably a few steps that you would have to take. Or if I hadn't done this in five or ten years, I would have to take as well. But because I did it so many times, you know, I make it look too easy. But isn't that what we have? Doesn't this give us a quadratic? Check it, put in x equal to L, don't we get back TS? If put in, if put in x equal to minus L, it'll also give us TS. And then if you want the maximum, what should you put into that equation to get for part B, the maximum? Put in x equal to 0, right? If you put in x equal to 0, you get just that it's TS plus Q dot L squared divided by 2K. It's just, the maximum is just this term right there. Okay, what is the heat flux at the wall? There's two ways of doing this. The heat flux at the wall, what do you think? Well, you can, uh, there's three ways of doing it. You can take this equation right here, and you can differentiate it. And so if I differentiate, what is dt dx from that equation? Isn't it um, Q dot L squared divided by 2K with a minus? And I'm going to have 2X divided by L squared. Get rid of the L squareds. I want to evaluate this at X equal to L. So put L there. And so what do we have? We have that DT DX is equal to minus Q dot. The 2's cancel. Um, L divided by K. Isn't that dt dx at x equal to L? Notice that it's a negative slope. It's sloped downward. Are you with me or no? All right. Now I want Q double prime, so I put minus K times what I just worked so hard to get dt dx at L. So I put a minus K times that, and you find that this just becomes Q dot times L, isn't it? Just Q dot times L. The heat flux at the wall is Q dot uh, times L. Um, I know that you had to differentiate and evaluate, blah, blah, blah. You could have just said, look, at everything that's generated on this side, Q dot times all of that volume, which is simply related to the length L, goes out one side. It has to go out by the flux at L, at the wall, at, at, at the surface. And then Q dot times the L has to go out this side. Everything to the left of the peak has to go out conduction out the other side. So there's some shortcuts to make it a little quicker, but there you go. Is that okay? You ready for a harder problem? 
Okay, let's jump into it. Steady state temperature distribution in a solid cylinder of radius R naught. So let me kind of draw it like this. This is R, it goes out to R naught. What's the zero? The zero is right there in the middle. Okay, this is the center line of the cylinder. It has uniform heat generation Q dot and a constant surface temperature TS. How are we going to solve for this temperature profile? There's the answer. How do we solve for that answer? How do we establish that? I want to know the temperature at any value R. So notice if I plotted temperature kind of in the Y direction, and maybe it would look like this, where it's TS right there, and the maximum will be in the middle. Notice that it's a quadratic in R, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a nice quadratic. It's nice, simple. Okay, um, how do we do it? I need my differential equation because it's 1D. It's not a PDE. It's just an ODE. And I need two boundary conditions. The boundary condition number one, right here. That's the hard one because it's like, hold it. What? what? Why do I have a boundary condition at R equal to zero? Because the slope has to be flat. Go back to your math class. They probably spent the whole lecture on that. But you get that the derivative of the temperature with respect to R at R equal to zero is zero. It can't be anything else. I mean, think about revolving theta around. It would be contradictory. It's flat. And then the next one is uh, T at R naught is equal to TS. Those are my two boundary conditions. What's my differential equation? Well, it's my heat equation. Um, you can put the, um, the del squared T is equal to minus Q dot divided by K. And I need that del squared in the cylindrical coordinates because it's a cylinder. And I only care about the R direction. And so after you do this a few times, it's 1 over R, the derivative with respect to R of R, dt dr, right? So there's my equation. Once you get your equation and your two boundary conditions, it's just math at that point. Somebody says, uh, hey, I got a 1 over R here and an R there. Let's just cancel them. Good idea or a bad idea? <laughs> Bad idea. Don't do that. Don't fall for that, right? So anyway, uh, what's the what strategy would you use with this ODE and two boundary conditions? Separate and integrate. That's my strategy. In the interest of time, can I leave this as a challenge? You should be able to do it. You should be prepared to do it on exams and do it in homeworks. It's kind of like it's well set up. Differential equation, boundary conditions, there's the solution. Can you go from, can you fill in the blanks, fill in the steps? All right, I'm going to move on. So, oh yeah, I was going to show. Here's that cylindrical, and it's steady state. We do have Q. Nothing in the Z, nothing in the phi. It was only in the R. And then we took that K outside, and there you go. Do a little manipulation. That's the equation. Temperature distribution across a wall. So it's in the wall, it's going from X goes from 0 to L. And L is 0.6 meters to be a numeric value. So L is 0.6. At an instant in time, this is a little tricky. They didn't say it was steady state. It's probably transient. But at some time, pop, there it is. There's the temperature profile. And they give it in this equation, A plus B plus Cx squared. So at, at an instant in time, they don't need to tell you what time it is or express time as a variable T. They just need to express temperature at any location X in that slab. So... T is in degrees C, X is in meters, A, here is your B 
here is your value and C is your value. I would spend some time checking it if I was you to make sure you understand what they're giving you for these coefficients A, B, and C because each of those coefficients have units you can tell. But the final answer has to be some temperature when I give X in meter into that equation. Let's say I put in 0.3 or something. Okay. The wall has a thermal conductivity K of 15 watts per meter degree C, like stainless steel. There is no heat generation in the wall, thankfully. Good. I don't like that Q dot term personally myself all that much. But uh, so that Q dot's equal to zero. The surface at L is exposed to a fluid. And that fluid T infinity is 100 degrees C. A lot of parts to this problem. Go slow. What is the temperature at x equal to zero? How are you going to do that one? What is the temperature at x equal to zero? All you have to do is stick in and evaluate the temperature at x equal to zero. Guess what? It, x is zero. It, isn't it the temperature just going to be at x equal to zero? Isn't that just going to be A? Is it just going to be 220? 220 it is. How about a temperature at L? Put L into the equation. Plug it in. This is great. Plug and chug. 116. So it's 220 over here, 116.8 there. Which one's higher? The one in the middle. Which one's lower? The surface temperature. Okay. What's the rate of heat transfer into the wall at x equal to zero. What's the heat flux there? Q double prime. How do I solve for Q double prime at x equal to zero? Use Fourier's law so that I had to differentiate my analytic expression. And then I multiply by negative k and evaluate at zero. So given t dot dot dot, I need dt dx, that's going to be b plus 2cx. I evaluate dt dx at x equal to 0. It just is b. I then multiply that by negative k, so I get negative k times dt dx at x equal to 0. That's going to be my q double prime at x equal to 0. So negative 15 negative 15 watts per meter degree C times my coefficient B. B was negative 190 degrees C per meter and the degrees C cancel. Watts per meter squared, good units. And they're going to be a negative times a negative. Boom. Let's see what the number comes out to be. 2,850 watts per meter squared. What about the rate of heat transfer out of the wall? Same approach. Same approach. And when we do that, 2,310. These are just numbers, right? Because it could be a transient problem. So somebody may say, well, how come they're not the same? Well, because there's some accumulation in the wall. It's being heated. There's more in than out, isn't there? Yeah, there's more in than out. Okay, what's the rate of change of energy stored in the by the wall? What's the rate of energy stored, change of energy stored by the wall? The difference in these two. <laughs> uh, what's the difference between those two? 2850 minus 2310. I'm bringing in so much on the right, so taking out on the left, but more is coming in than out. So there you go. All right, the harder one, what is the convection coefficient H on this side right there? How do I calculate that H? Well, we calculated the temperature of the surface right here. So the temperature of the surface is 116.8. We know the heat flux going out. That is 
one o watts per meter squared. We go back to Newton's law of convection. So that means Q double prime convection is equal to H times T S minus T infinity. Only unknown is H. So that's Q double prime convection, 2310 watts per meter squared, divided by my two temperatures. Temperature of the surface, 116.8 minus the temperature far away, 100 degrees C. Hopefully that makes sense. 32 watts per meter squared. Hey, how come they put Kelvin instead of degrees C? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. It's a temperature difference. Okay. Three centimeter diameter sphere has a heat generation rate, so there's my Q dot. The sphere conductivity is given, the surface temperature is given. What is the temperature profile in the sphere? Differential equation, boundary conditions, solve. When you go and look for your spherical coordinate system, you don't have any of this complicated phi or theta. It just boils down to 1 over r squared, the rate of change with respect to r times r squared k, and then the rate of change with respect to, of temperature with respect to r. If you have heat source, you need that in its steady state, so that goes away. So you get an equation that's 1 over r squared. I'm going to put it in the ordinary derivative because it's only r. Derivative of temperature with respect to r equal to minus q dot divided by k, treating k as constant. That's my differential equation. Boundary condition, the rate of change of temperature at r equal to 0 is 0. Just like on our cylindrical, spherical, it has to be. And then uh, temperature at R, I'm going to call that, what is that, not R naught of 3 centimeters, which is 0 0.03 meter, it is equal to a given value of 45 degrees, or I'm going to just call it TS which is 45 degrees. You work in symbols and then substitute numeric values later. Can you solve that? Yeah, after a little review, and you get something like that. Analytic solution. Where is the maximum temperature going to be at? Can you tell? In the middle, at r equal to 0. So you would evaluate that temperature at r equal to 0 to get the maximum. And you come up, oh, it's 59 degrees C. What's the heat flux at the outer surface of the sphere? You can do it mathematically, saying, okay, I've got my temperature distribution. Go back, get dt, dr, then evaluate it at r naught, multiply by negative k, and that's Q double prime at the surface, isn't it? That's one way. Or you can say, look it, if I have Q dot, that's how much is being generated. If I knew the volume of the sphere, it all has to go out over the surface of the sphere. And so the Q double prime of the surface times the area of the sphere, the surface area of the sphere. So the Q double prime is just Q dot. That's a bad looking dot. Q dot. Divide of um, volume of a sphere uh, over area of a sphere. Okay, let me scoot down a little bit. Who recalls the volume of a sphere in terms of uh, radius R naught? What's the volume? You are good. Four thirds pi R naught cubed. What's the area of a sphere? What's the area of the sphere? Four pi R naught squared. So if I do the volume divided by the area, so the volume divided by the area for the sphere, what does that turn out to be? R naught divided by 3. You don't have to differentiate and all that. This is Q dot multiplied by R naught 
divided by 3. All right. Okay, if the fluid is a 25 degrees C, what is the convection coefficient? Same thing. H is equal to Q at the surface divided by T at surface minus T infinity. These are good problems. I hope that you really work a bunch of them. Okay. So you get the convection coefficient. A force meter thick layer of coal. So you might want to put the thickness like this in the x direction going up from 0 to L, which is 4 meters. Okay. It's all a coal. This is a coal layer of coal. It has a volumetric heat generation rate, Q dot, equal to 2.5 watts per meter cube. Not a lot, but what's it from? Some slow oxidation of coal par particles. Guess the pile of coal gets hot, lay in there. The effective conductivity of the coal is low, 0.25 watts per meter K. The bottom surface is well insulated. What does that tell me about the change in temperature with respect to X at X equal to zero if it's well insulated? Zero. You are good. And I should ask a clicker question. I can still ask a clicker question, can't I? Yeah. So the question is, it'll be positive, answer A. It'll be zero, answer B. Or negative, answer C. What is the TDX at X equal to zero? Let's just take a look. I don't understand why four people said positive. Isn't it zero? So let's give up on that one. But um, maybe those that are not here in the room, I don't know. Sorry if I'm confusing you somehow. The top surface is exposed to a convection with the H given of 5 watts per meter squared degree C. And hey, professor, you just change it. I know I do that all the time. Sorry. This, and then the T infinity temperature of the air is a 25 degrees C. Okay, uh, what is the boundary condition at the top right there? So I'm going to call that at X equal to L is um, um, minus K dT dX at X equal to L. Is that equal to, I'm going to give you some, some, some uh, answers, H times T at L? H times T at L minus T infinity, or H times T at L minus T naught. Answer A, B, or C. So we'll stop. So the boundary condition comes from a statement that Q double prime conduction is equal to Q double prime convection. It's an energy balance at a very thin little layer right here. So what's coming in on the side below is conduction. What's going out on the top surface is convection. And we know that this is by Fourier's law minus K the T dx evaluated at X equal to L at the if you like put L minus or something just a skosh inside the solid at surface L. Okay. Convection. Well, what was the law of convection? H times the hot surface. Isn't that the temperature at L? But, Professor, what's this temperature down here? That's temperature at naught. That's, that's that temperature. What's the temperature right there? Temperature at L. What's the temperature infinity? Far away in the fluid. That's the temperature difference. It drives it into the fluid. So isn't the best answer B? Isn't it B? All right. So we have our boundary condition. And now you have to get a uh, solution to the governing equation. What's our equation again? Our differential equation is that um, the second derivative of temperature with respect to space 
is equal to minus q dot divided by k. Right? Okay. Um, well, if we go back here, you can get your temperature distribution, but we may not even need it. Let's read part A. What is a conduction heat flux at the top surface? Q double prime. Um, do you have enough information to solve for that? What's the, what is that heat flux, Q double prime, at the top surface? We don't know TL. We, know, we don't know TL. We do know H and T infinity. So if we could calculate TL, then we could calculate, you know, get the Q double prime at the convection off of it, which is the same as conduction at the top surface. But there's another way of doing it. It's a total energy balance. If I come down here and do a big control volume and I say, what's generated inside there? Isn't that Q dot? And then if I multiply by L, the height, and then I multiply by A, which is sort of a perpendicular A into the paper, it's going to cancel. Isn't that equal to what goes out the top? Q double prime at the top times the same A. That's where the A's cancel. Yeah, right? So with that hint, I'm going to change this to uh, numeric. Give me your answer, please. What is, what is the answer for part A? The conduction heat flux at the top surface, and we want it in watts per meter squared. All right, I need to go ahead and stop, okay? So we'll stop it. And the Q double prime at the top surface is, did you get it? So let's take a look at our results. And we have 10 right there, right? Does it look good? All right. Um, <clears throat> now, next question, what is the surface temperature, TS? Now, you could go back and solve for the T and do all that work, but you know what you just solved for? You just solved for Q double prime at the surface. Isn't it 10 watts per meter squared? Do we know H? Do we know T infinity? Can you please calculate the temperature at the surface, TL or TS, whatever you want to call it? And let's take a look. We got that. Did you get it in? Oh, no, sorry about that. Did, how about 27? 27? Right? Hey, there's another 27, isn't there? Is there any other 27s? Nope. Okay, last part. Highest temperature in the cold layer. You got to get it. Where's the highest temperature? Right there, isn't it? Isn't the highest temperature down here? Isn't the temperature profile doing a quadratic like that? Highest temperature at the bottom. The third surface is 27. We just calculated. How are you going to do that one? You get the temperature profile and then evaluate it at x equal to 0. You have your two boundary conditions. So a little bit of work in the interest of time, it's going to be 107. Okay? The heat diffusion equation. The what equation? The heat diffusion equation. Where is the heat diffusion equation discussed in this chapter? Look at uh, this right here. What What is the heat, right here, the heat diffusion equation? We emphasized it in that section. And it had complementary boundary and initial conditions. The heat diffusion equation is a statement of what? A, B, C, D, or E. Is everybody in? Last one. I've got to close it. So we close it. The heat diffusion equation is a statement of the conservation of energy. What's state, which one of these is closest to the statement of the conservation of energy? The first law of thermodynamics. First law. First law. First law. First law. First law. All right. All done. Thank you for your attention.